right, it is five o'clock, so I will uh, call to order this meeting of the Finance and Personnel Committee. Uh, starting out with the roll call, Alder Feldy. Present. Alder Flicky Paneski. Here. Alder Perala. Here. Uh, Alder Ackley. Alder Ackley is excused and chair is here. We have four, that is a quorum. Will you all please stand and join me in the pledge? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, barring any uh, objections, we'll jump over item four, the introduction of committee members and staff. I believe we all know each other in the room. And that would bring us to item five, which is approval of the minutes from our May 9th meeting. Uh, do we have any discussion on those minutes? Otherwise, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. Motion to approve. Second. All right. Uh, we have a motion and a second then. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it, and the motion passes, our minutes are approved. Next up is item number six, which is RO number 12 of 2223, uh, reporting that pursuant to resolution number 66 of 2021, uh, authorizing the city administrator to negotiate settlement of certain claims made by the city of Sheboygan, city invoice number 8895 in the amount of $17,397.87 billed to uh, Jorge Deanda regarding traffic or damage to a traffic control signal and street light located on the median of Taylor Drive and Washington Avenue on September 21st, 2020 has been settled with a payment to the city of Sheboygan in the amount of $16,209.58. Does anybody have any comments to add for this one? Thank you, Chair. The $16,209.58 is below the $17,397.87, but it is uh, still covered within, within our parameters of the, the billing. Uh, typically, the insurance company wanted to pay us less than the $16,209, um, but uh, with Jessica and myself, uh, we were able to get the 16209 versus what they were offering. Questions or comments? If not, I believe we'll be looking for a motion to file. All right, we have a motion and a second then seeing no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye, the ayes have it and the motion passes. Next up is item number seven, which is resolution number 16 of 2223, a resolution authorizing entering into an agency agreement with Credit Management Control Incorporated with regard to providing collection services to the city. Evening, uh, the resolution before you is exactly as it states, a agreement with a credit collection agency. The uh, City previously had a collection agency, but we had moved away from that when that um, individual stopped doing collections. So now it's been several years and we are looking to bring back a credit uh, agent, collection agency to assist us with collecting some of the accounts receivable bills that are outstanding for several years and even the ones that are currently um, not being sent in. So we are looking for their expertise in helping us also develop some internal processes to help us get more funds and, and um, continue to improve the cash flow within the finance department. Questions or comments? Alder Perella. I have just a question about um, the, the commission rates. Could you please explain how that is going how that is going to work. So it is a 25% of uh, the, the credit, and then what is this, the, what is the 10% trip? 
Sure, so there are two types of accounts that this uh, company is going to be looking at. If they go through their regular processing and collection um, efforts, which would be um, sending out notices, they can do quite a few different skip tracing, things like that, that we don't have the ability to do currently in finance. That will be the 25% of whatever they collect. TRIP is the Tax Refund Intercept Program, which is through the state of Wisconsin. So it has a little less of the efforts that would go into the regular collections. So they will do the monitoring and collecting through that system. And that's why it's the 10% rather than the 25. And, and they will determine which one to apply. I believe they're going to look at doing both if possible. So if it does come through the TRIP system, we'll get the lower rate. So either one. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Alder Flicky Paneski. Thank you. Um, I would be in favor of this. However, I would like to make an amendment that, oh, first we have to put the motion on the floor. Um, I move that this be on the floor. I move that this be approved. Oh. Perfect. All right, do we have a second? Second. Okay, please continue. Thank you. Now that the motion is on the floor, I would like to propose an amendment that um, this committee, and, and Alder Perella kind of tweaked it too, um, that this committee once a year be given a report for um, what was sent to collection and then the net that we received and receive that in this committee on an annual basis. Do we have a second on the amendment? I second. All right. I don't believe an amendment is debatable. I suppose we get to decide since it's at the committee level. So if there's any other comments on the amendment, otherwise we'll be voting on amending the document. Other Barella? Yeah, I just want to say I agree with that just because there is a contract here of three years. So it would be good for us to evaluate if it is worth it and how much we really get back out of it. Also, to you know, just to, to, to do an assessment, a, a correct assessment. So I agree with that. Thank you. Any other discussion on the amendment? If not, all in favor of amend, uh, amending the resolution as Alder Flicky Paneski stated? Aye. 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 All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it and the motion is passed. The resolution is amended. All right. So we now have the amended resolution in front of us. Any other comments on the material at large? All right. Seeing none then, all in favor of approving the amended resolution? Aye. 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 All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it and the motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next up is item number eight, which is resolution number 18 of 2223, a resolution to authorize a transfer of appropriations in the 2022 budget. Thank you. The attached resolution uh, takes a levy that was originally allocated to the 2022 transit budget, and it is taking that levy back from transit and reallocating it to capital projects. Those are listed on the IFC that are in, that's in the packet. There are seven different projects, two at the library, two at police, two at fire, and then also some traffic um, upgrades as well. So this is maximizing the CARES Act dollars that the transit, you, transit um, is getting from the federal government. So we are just making sure that we're maximizing the utilization of those funds because they will receive the money through the CARES Act to supplement that 450,000. Other Perella. The money, uh, I, I have no problem at all with this, on the contrary, but I wonder, the money, this additional money that we are reallocated to the, in, to the seven projects, are these in addition to what was in the 2022-2027 uh, CIP uh, forecast for this project or are within? So I am not certain if they were in the 2022 they were not in the 2022 capital budget. However, they were in the 2023 and beyond budget. And so because this, these are one-time funds that we have, we figured we could kind of get some of these one-time projects out of the way. So we brought those projects forward. So they were, no, they were not in 2022, they are in addition. 
they were not in the five years. So it is, for example, the, the police, the police um, range remediation. This is a project that it was already in the five years, 2022, 2027 CIP. So is this, uh, um, $45,000 in addition to what it was already forecast for that project, or it is uh, part of that amount that had been allocated already or forecasted? Sure, so these projects were originally forecasted in future years, but we, so it's not in addition to future, we actually eliminated them from the 2023 to 2027 plan and brought them forward to 2022. So we had, let's say, for the um, police range remediation, for example, the police department came forward with the 2023 to 2027 projects. It was listed in there when they came to Administra Administrator Wolf with their original requests. Because we had this option to reallocate the funds from transit, we removed them from the 2023 to 2027 budget and now just brought them forward with this resolution for approval in 2022. And altogether, that project will be $45,000 more expensive or it will be as expensive? It will be 45,000 was originally planned and that's what we are giving them Perfect. to complete it. Thank you so much. Yes. Any other questions or comments on this one? And if not, we'll be looking for a motion to approve. A second. Okay. Uh, Alder Flecky Um I, I am assuming that the reason we, sorry about that. I am assuming that the reason we are moving these ahead and opting for these projects is one, we have to spend the dollars because they're federal mm -hmm. dollars, and two, these projects qualify for those things. I mean, I, I, is the money that we receive from the feds very specific to specific types of things so that these were the ones that were the most logical to pull out? So the amount that is actually getting funded by the Federal or CARES Act dollars, um, which is truly through the state, but that's a, the grant, CARES Act grant, um, that actually the money is based on transit's um, use. So we are just taking the, the tax levy that was given to transit and kind of taking it back. So they will use the CARES Act to supplement their budget and we can use those, the funds from the CARES Act in capital. Perfect, thank you, got it. All right, uh, we have a motion and a second then. Are there, or is there any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, chair votes aye, the ayes have it, the motion passes. Hmm. Next up we have item number nine, which was a direct referral of resolution number 21 of 21-22, or of 22-23, uh, approving the financial year 2022 one year annual action plan for the community development uh, block grant program submission. Thank you, Chair. So if you have access to uh, Muni code, I would encourage you to look at the um, IFC that's attached to this document because there's a lot of numbers and we have to try to iron out who's gonna get allocations for the next program year. So the city receives a yearly allocation of around a million dollars. Um, in 2021, we received 933,000 from the Community Development Block Grant Program through HUD. In 2022, we were notified last week that we're getting $865,259. These funds can be used for uh, projects in low to moderate income census tracts and or people that are households that are low to moderate income. So um, it has to really be qualified to what I would call the central city, which is an area from Geely Avenue to Union and North 18th Street to the lake, give or take. Under federal law, so of the 865,000 that we get a, a year, 15% uh, of those funds can be spent on public service activities. 
um, or nonprofits, and 20% can be spent on planning and admin. Those are, those are the two caps that we have to follow that we can't exceed um, those funds. So earlier this year, the city issued a request for proposals to public service agencies or nonprofits uh, to submit their request. Um, and based on the projects that were submitted, I'll now review um, shortly what we have, but we received um, a number of applications with two new applicants this year, Million Dreams and Flawless Hoops. So we, um, just starting from the top, so Shoreline Metro is budgeted every year in the city budget for $42,493. Um, that's what was awarded in 2021, and that's what the request is in 2022. Family Service Association um, was awarded $15,438.29 in 2021. Um, their request in 2022 is $17,250. Family Connections was re uh, awarded $4,894. Their request was $5,000. Lakeshore Cap was awarded $14,859. The request this year is $23,573. Big Brothers, Big Sisters was awarded $11,719. Their request is $21,370. Sheboygan County Interfaith Organization was awarded $10,000. They did not submit an application this year, um, so the request is zero. Um, the Salvation Army was awarded $38,595 last year. They did not submit an application this year. They, their person that was in charge failed to respond. And then the two new applicants, Million Dreams, which is the daycare on the north side of town in the old Sheboygan Christian School, uh, they requested $622,908. And no, that's not an error. They, that is the number they requested. Um, and then Flawless Hoops, which I'll talk about the organization shortly, uh, requested $10,000. So most of you probably are familiar with a lot of these organizations. Shoreline Metro obviously is the city's bus uh, system. Family Service Association uh, does budget counseling um, and, and some rental, rent smart programs. Family Connections is uh, reduced childcare vouchers. Lakeshore CAP, uh, administers what's called a one-stop shop or the um, housing program for tenants that are um, having challenges making rent payments as well as uh, homeowner payments. They are also administering a mortgage assistance program. Big Brothers Big Sisters is a mentoring program for youth. Sheboygan County Interfaith Organization um, runs the Bridge Way and Beyond program, the domestic abuse shelter. Salvation Army emergency lodge or the um, homeless shelter. Million Dreams is the daycare um, operation and Flawless Hoops is a new organization that is um, partnering to take kids off the street and give them a opportunity to do mentoring, youth mentoring through basketball. So they lease a school, um, an old gym up on, in the Emmanuel Lutheran on Illinois Avenue and they have mentors that they mentor um, youth in the community, deal with challenges at home, life skills, all of that stuff through basketball games. So uh, they've gotten some funding from the Johnsonville uh, Sausage Company, uh, and you know they really are, it looks like a program that's giving people that have challenges another means of, of obtaining services. So, with all of that, as I said, by definition, we can spend 15% maximum on, um, of the funds on those activities, and um, that's about $129,000, and the request was over, requests were over a million dollars. So um, obviously everyone's not gonna get what they asked for, um, but we'll talk about the recommendations shortly. We did receive two requests from for housing, which isn't subject to the cap. So Partners for Community Development requested 35,000 and Habitat for Humanity Lakeside requested 27,000. And then there are some other projects that are out there that aren't subject to any kind of cap and are either budgeted in our normal process um, or are there. So the 
First one is neighborhood enhancements, signage and grants, 25,000. This is to continue funding projects of our neighborhood associations, as well as to look at some signage improvements that we're working with the Department of Public Works on for street signage. Uh, historic preservation at $69,920, and that is to do the continuation of a program that the Redevelopment Authority administers on behalf of the city for historic signage and or facade renovations of buildings on A Street. Uh, St. Clair Avenue resurfacing project is a uh, resurfacing project from 9th to 14th Street, 250,000, and that was in the 2022 budget. Program administration is subject to the 20% cap at $173,051, and that's to fund basically half of the Department of uh, Planning and Development, so a good chunk of our, um, of the five, four people in the Planning and Development Department, portions of their salaries are funded out of this to help the general fund. And then the last one is, is a yearly payment that we need to make for the next 20 years, for the Uptown Social Loan, um, a Section 108 payment of 160,000. So the last section of this is city staff recommendations. So uh, we've taken a look at um, what we think is realistic to uh, the entities and have made some recommendations on how to fund the public service agencies, all up for discussion by you if you so choose. So. Partners for Community Development at 32,500, Habitat for Humanity at 25,000, Million Dreams at 18,000, uh, Shoreline Metro 42,493, Family Service Association at 17,000, Family Connections at 4,800, Lakeshore Cap at 21,000, Big Brothers Big Sisters at 19,500, and Flawless Hoops at 6,995. So what, we, what you'll see is the two newer entities are less um, than their requests. The other ones are relatively close to what they either received last year or what their request is this year. Um, we just wanna make sure, given that these are federal dollars, that they've got all of their federal stuff in order to be receiving federal funds. Um, and we have some concerns, frankly, about Million Dreams. Um, whether they're gonna be up and running in time for starting to collect data. So they have just announced that when they applied, they said they were gonna be um, operational by May or June, and now after reading a newspaper article, it looks like they're not gonna be operational till the end of the year. Our program year for CDBG does not follow the calendar year. It runs April 1st to March 31st. So we technically have started our new program year already, um, and a lot of these agencies are collecting their uh, program beneficiary data and their benchmarks, if you will, already, because it's a really a continuation of a program. But when you have a new program that doesn't have the capabilities of accepting um, low to moderate income uh, childcare people, and if it's not gonna be available until the end of the year, they really only have a few years to receive a few months to receive, to get to the benchmarks that they claim that they were going to support with this funding. So, you know, part of me is it's premature to um, award money to them. Um, if, if the committee so chooses to not award the 18,000, then we'd have to distribute that uh, in some other means. Um, but this is the recommendation at this point, so I, you know, I'd be happy to take any thoughts or comments that you guys might have. Sure, uh, we'll start off, Alder Flecky Paneski. Um, how is it that you, how do you notify the programming entities that these dollars are available? Do you go through United Way? How, how do you, how do you As reach? It, it, earlier it says we issue a request for proposals. So uh -huh. we send out a request for proposals to all the agencies that have ever shown interest. We publish uh, stuff in the newspaper. It goes on the city's website. It's sent out through social media and people can apply um, if, you know, if they so choose. Okay, another one. Um, and then the other is, uh, we, we were just talking about Shoreline Metro. So we're, 
they've got ARPA money and we're doing all the transfer that we just did. So is this 42,000 for bus passes for low-income people? What's the 42,000 This is for running the evening and weekend service to get people to their jobs. So we take it as economic development because it's a source of helping low to moderate income people to keep the cost down to be able to get to employment. Thank you. Oh, there, Perella. The HUD money, the CDBG funds, are not, we have to spend them, right? Well, if we don't spend them, then they go to some other can community. We can we, um, I meant, can we, um, I just want to understand how it works. Can we use it in next quarter or uh, next year? Can we keep the money that we don't use this year? No, we have to there allocate no it by the yearly basis. There is no basis. rollover. Okay, all right. And I, I will need to excuse myself from the voting on this because I'm part of. The, I, I work for Family Service Association. I understand. I have to abstain. Yes. Any other questions or comments, uh, Alder Feldy? Um, I just, I just have a comment. Um, I, I'm a little disappointed with. Uh, million dreams, um, that, that's a big leap from being re ready the end of May, June, and now all of a sudden not till the end, end of the year. And these are, these are families that are desperately in need of that daycare. Is there anything we can do to, you know, push them along, get them, help them to, I, I, right here's money that, that they could have had. And, uh, well, let me clarify that this money is not for capital projects. This money is to operate a program so it'll pay the right. salary of an intake supervisor or somebody like that. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm guessing it's supply chain issues and getting contractors there and getting the work done in a timely fashion. I think, I think there was an underestimation early on in this project over what it was going to take to renovate that facility to get them up and running. And I think once they got in there and found out that they needed to deal with all of the HVAC and they needed to put a uh, fire suppression <coughs> so sprinkler system in there and all of that stuff just takes clearly time. And I think, you know, I, I think who, the people, you know, I think some of the challenges are that they had anticipated getting this stuff done relatively quickly. I think it comes down to getting contractors there to do the work, and I don't know that the city can incentivize them to do it, and I'm not sure where the funding is coming from to do that piece. Does, does that, can I go again? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, does that, would that fall under maybe Family Service Association that, you know, we give them a little bit more money to, you know, help them find daycare and assist um, those that need that help? Well, family, it won't be Family Service Association. It might be Family Connections, who does vouchers okay. for low-income folks. Um, they, you know, they requested... They only requested you know, five thousand dollars, and we're recommending giving them forty-eight hundred. So I guess oh. we can give them two hundred dollars more if we want. But um, <laughs> you know, so I I, I don't okay. know that we want to give. The challenge we have is, you know, I think, and just be to be you know forthcoming on this is. We didn't receive two applications because I think there was issues in the different organizations over how they, who was, who thought someone was taking care of it and then it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Normally we would fund the Salvation Army at $38,000 to $40,000, which would, you know, take a good chunk of our money um, to run the emergency lodge, which is very beneficial to the community. The fact that they failed to submit an application on time um, when it, you know, was clearly shown to them that, you know, they kind of missed the deadline. So, you know, next year we're going to have that same, you know, request coming in. So the numbers are going to look a lot different. So, you know, I don't know if, you know, I, I don't know if it makes sense to, you know, award some, you know, everybody to the max for this year and just say that it's an anomaly. But, you know, going forward, it's never an easy process because we always have requests you know, that far exceed what the, the what we can spend. 
Thank you, Chair. Other Flecky Vanessa. Thank you. Um, so, so back to the million dreams. If they are unable to get their program up and running before this this particular grant year ends March first of next March, year. March thirty first of twenty twenty three. Okay, that that should make it. I, w I was going to say if if any of these these organizations can't spend their money, do we get the opportunity to reallocate or not? No, most of them are a upfront one-time payment. Um, what we look at then is what they report out as their benchmarks, and if they fail to meet their benchmarks, then our recommendation the following year to, would be to come and say, not fund them because they're not, you know, they're not on track. So we, Without getting into the minutia of all the federal yeah. the laws, we have to spend a certain portion of these funds by January 31st, so, or we don't meet the timeliness ratio, and then we have to justify to HUD why we didn't spend our money in time, and that can affect future years. So we always make, we make one-time upfront payments, and then they're required to submit quarterly reports. And if they're not meeting their benchmarks over those quarterly reports, that's then reflected in what the allocation is the following year. So most of our, you know, senior um, entities, which are the, you know, partners and Shoreline Metro and Family Service, the, the ones that come every year that we fund, they understand it, and they, you know, they've got a, a means of fulfilling the requirements of the program. It's just these new ones that um, you know could be a, could be a challenge, and I guess then that would just reflect on whether we would fund them in a future year. So, in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion, do do you do or like like you do for home renter uh, classes? Do you do anything like that? For organizations if they want federal money. I get that the federal guidelines are very strict and you need to do the compliance and you just have to do it or the money doesn't appear again. Are, are we helping some of the newer organizations along or not? What do you mean by helping? I, there, are, there are organizations who every year come and ask for the same amount of money or a little bit more or a little bit less. There may be other organizations out there that are likewise as needy, only they either A, don't know about it, or B, don't have the infrastructure or don't have the, the they don't have the staffing even to, to do the detail work that's necessary that comes along with federal dollars. Do we do anything to help those organizations along? Not, we don't have the staff to do that either. Um, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It's online reporting and, you know, they, or, you know, paper reporting. So, um, you know, we try to do technical assistance and we go out and do monitoring and we do that, but we can't be there every month to help them no. collect the data. No. It's 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 really about having, the entities having the infrastructure in place to be able to make sure, one, that the people they're serving are low to moderate income households and okay. collecting income. Sure. We don't even get to see all of that income data because it's confidential. Right. So, you know, that's the first piece. Then the second piece is quantifying and keeping all of that stuff so that on a quarterly basis you can report the number of households that were this income bracket that you served. You can report the number of households that were white, Hispanic, all of the different uh, demographics that are required. So, you know, it, there's, you know, Family Service Association, sorry to look at you, Grazia, but I know that you're there. I mean, they have the means of doing that because they get other federal funding that kind of forces them to, you know, develop the system and track all that stuff. Yeah, that's the unfortunate matter is, you know, that this, there's a lot of federal reporting that has yes. to come with it. And if they don't have the manpower and the infrastructure to collect that data, you know, then they typically get it one, get the funding one year and we don't see them again, or they go other means to find private donations that don't require this kind of reporting. Okay. The, the RDA gets their money from this same pool of assets? 
for the historic preservation program, yes. Okay. For the revolving loan fund, yeah. we don't put any new money into it because we have substantial money revolving it through. It revolves. Thank you. Do you have any comments? Sure. And Chad, I just wanted to add a couple of things. I believe it was Flawless Hoop is actually a newer one that came forward, I believe, last year, correct? This is our first request. Our first year? Okay. So we do, from time to time, hear from other organizations, but like you said, a lot of it really is up to them if they're going to step forward. And correct me if I'm wrong, but didn't you um, request a position that would actually help with um, help your department as far as with the grants and, and reviewing reviewing the, the tireless information that is needed when we give money out, making sure that they are complying correctly? Correct, so that position that was held in the last council year, part of that was going to be handled managing this and the neighborhoods so that we can deal with that's all of these reporting because we have to report this to the feds on a quarterly basis, yes. Right, so basically what I'm bringing forward is the fact that if we recall that position request, if we're concerned about being able to assist additional nonprofits out in the community, that this position, if approved in the future, would actually assist the, the city in helping them. That is correct. Thank you. Oh, there, Perella. Um, I just wanted to add in, in to for Roberta's question that the so there are some demographics and criteria in relation to diversity and generally speaking to minority that have to be me met in order to qualify for this type of funds. And so what you were talking about is somehow already incorporated in the funds Correct. as far as diversity goes. Um, the, the, I do agree that um, this is part of what an organization does to create internally the strength and the capability of qualifying, so it is up to the, the organization. However, what perhaps we could do is um, a different type of reaching out into the community because I am pretty sure that there are other organizations out there, as my colleague mentioned, that may not be aware or aware, fully aware uh, of the opportunity. So maybe that can be, we could perhaps uh, discuss that another time to how we can improve that because there are we, many, we, many more public we, service organizations. I didn't get into the specifics of this, but we also do a, we have to submit a five year consolidated plan that's based on a need survey. So we have to meet, we have to meet certain benchmarks that we tell HUD we're gonna meet as well by funding different agencies. So in this one, um, homeless, uh, in this five year plan, which was approved two years ago, we're kind of midstream through it, homeless, youth mentoring, mental health services, you know, those types of services are all identified in there. So yes, we can go out, we just can't have every organization, they have to align with our five-year plan that we submit to HUD as to how we're gonna funnel our funds to the correct populations. Um, but as long as they fit that means, sure, that there could be a possibility for that. And I would be open to how to reach out to other people. We've had, you know, I've been here 15 years, we've had a lot of organizations over that time that have applied, and then when we go out and audit their books and we find out that they're co-mingling their funds with their personal funds, and there's no separation of federal and state and everything else, you know, those are the ones that we've, you know, we tell them we're sorry, I, you know, I, I, you don't have the means to, at this point, to be able to meet the requirements. So, you know, that kind of comes out in the monitoring and we go out with the finance department and monitor five, six, seven organizations a year just to look at their financials and see how they're going and how they're doing, collecting the data and all of that stuff to make sure that they're keeping on track because we have to report that to HUD as well. So some of them have come in, but if there is, you know, means of getting the information out there to other groups, we're willing to consider that. Thank you. I'm gonna ask that we ran it in just a little bit on this one since the actual uh, subject of the resolution is the allocation itself, other discussion-wise. 
valuable as well, but uh, do we have any other comments uh, or proposals on the allocation? Uh, Alder Flicky Pineski. Thank you. Um, the one that fell off the page of me is $250,000 for a street resurfacing. How did that, how does that, how does that fit into this pool of money? Well, we, public facilities is a, um, is a <laughs> eligible activity and we've typically worked with the public works department to find a street in a low to moderate income neighborhood that needs to be resurfaced or could, or reconstructed. So we, as part of the capital planning projects, look for those types of things because it's really a neighborhood revitalization and this was one of those streets that the pavement ratings were failing and that it needed money. So this is, this money is being matched with, um, what do you call that, wheel tax money. Um, no, not wheel tax. Um, Sales tax. Sales tax money from the county. Okay. Um, so, but it's gotta be in a specific area of the community um, that's in a neighborhood that's serving low to moderate income, so uh, families. So that's where this, and, and frankly, we're doing street improvements anyway, um, and it's a good place to spend a good chunk of money with not a lot of administration required to it. Is this the street that's still cobblestones? No. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. That'd be an upgrade. <laughs> All right, uh, any other questions or comments on this one? Otherwise, uh, I'm assuming we'll at least use staff recommendations as the starting point, and if anybody would like to make changes to that, we'll jump off from the numbers we have in front of us on the IFC. I move that we adopt the staff recommendations as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second then. Seeing no further discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Any abstentions? <laughs> All right, and uh, chair votes aye. The ayes have it, the motion passes. Thank you. Yay. Thank you for your work. Oh. Yeah. All right, next up, this is a presentation only. We have item number 10, the compensation study review with Patrick Lynn from Carlson Detman. Thank you, I'm just introducing Patrick from Carlson Detman. Um, tonight he has a presentation um, about kind of a high level review in, of the process and results from the compensation study that has been ongoing since last year. I have forwarded the presentation to all of you um, so that it is in your email if you need to reference it at all. From today, uh, we will be bringing forward the actual wage schedule or wage um, scale that has been provided from Carlson Detman that will be presented on the special June 7th Finance and Personnel Committee meeting that you should have all received the invitation to. So with that, I will turn it over to Patrick. Good evening, everyone. Um, first of all, I'm just taking a peek here. Um, if by the time, if I don't, I'm, a, I'm not able to answer all of your questions this evening, I am available um, on the 7th. I was just peeking here. But I guess, first of all, I want to introduce myself. Um, Patrick Flynn from Carlson Devon, as Caitlin indicated. Actually, I'm coming to you live from Chilton, Wisconsin, just a little ways down the road. Um, I had hoped to, to be there this evening, but I have a eighth grade choir concert coming up about 7.15 this evening. So I got to um, fulfill my parental duties here to um, do that. But I've been doing this for about nine years. I spent about 19 years in the public sector prior to that um, as a director of human resources. Um, my last stop along my career was um, 13 years as a director of human resources for Calumet County. So as it relates to the public sector, um, me and my team um, have a, a wealth of public sector background, and I believe that helps us in these projects. But we also know that each community is, is unique. And that was one of the things that we had to um, learn with Sheboygan, just as we have to learn with every other one of our projects. And normally these projects um, take a, a lot less time, but in, I think both of our teams, um, the, the city's team and our team had some bumps along the way. And so we're, we're happy to be at this stage right now. Um, as we go through the information this evening, um, I would invite you that if you do have questions, um, I don't, have um, the pictures on, so I can't see if someone's trying to indicate, um, but feel free to interrupt me if it helps answer the question. 
but also knowing, um, as with everything, that until um, there's a final adoption, everything's drafted, and if a recommendation is made, you know, the, the numbers might change in terms of what we're talking about tonight. Just need to say that just to cover our backsides. Um, but as we look at this, you know, as it relates to data, um, I want to make certain that I'm touching on your plan tonight. So if I go a little bit too quickly over some of the introductory materials, I'm certain you'll let me know. But in each project, we look at um, a, a couple of measures. We look at lots of measures, but the, the first well, couple of things we look at are what's the age of, of the employee base in the city and, and what are the years of service looking like? And it, and it tells us some stories in terms of how, how much will you be in the marketplace moving forward um, with this particular slide talking about you know, the age profile of the city, you know, cumulative about 41, almost 42% of the city's employees are at or over the age of 50. If I were to use this as a bench or look at our benchmark data, that's pretty common in terms of what we would see. I would, I would argue that about five years ago or so, that number was a lot more frequently around 50%. But I think we've all seen and, and um, dealt with a, a large number of retirements, especially during the pandemic. But again, I would say probably in the next 10 years or so, give or take, of course, you know, an employee's decision to retire is uniquely theirs, and, and we certainly can't predict one each individual. But you stand to lose about 42% of your, your workforce for no other reason than retirement over the course of the next 10 years, like I said, give or take. And that's an important thing to note as you look at how competitive are our wages to, to bring the talent in, and especially in today's marketplace. Um, the other metric, um, how many employees um, are less than five years of service and then working all your way through. So if I look at the two um, extremes here, you, know, you have three employees with greater than 35 years of service. Um, so just under 2% of your workforce, but that less than five years of service, which is the, the metric that we pay attention to most closely, again, you're pushing 40%, about 37.7. Um, again, comparing to our benchmark, this is right in the neighborhood, somewhere in the you know, 33 to 40% range is what we would expect to see from most public sector employers, especially with the more recent turnover that we've experienced. And so again, from this measure, what we're trying to look at, again, from a compensation standpoint, I think you can interpret this for a whole bunch of reasons, is that every organization you know, has their, its new employees. And we would argue that at about the five-year mark, maybe more, maybe less, you know, those employees have found a redeeming quality in the city and have chosen to make it their employer for what we hope to be the long haul. And so that five-year mark tends to be that. And so again, do you have compensation structures and practices that put you in a competitive position? Compensation certainly isn't the only thing. And we'll talk about that in just a moment, but I think it's helpful to kind of start the conversation looking through that lens. I'm just gonna skip past the next two slides. I'll, I'll briefly mention them because they're the library data. Um, the age about 46.5% at or above the age of 50. So again, not that much different than the, the general city. And for years of service, almost 40% less than five years of service. And again, not that much different from the city. So those, those data points track pretty well between the two organizations. The way we like to approach our business, and I would I would tend to believe that most compensation consultants approach um, their business from, from the lens of, of total rewards. This is not a new concept. I think everyone approaches it slightly differently, but ultimately gets to the same place. You know, we put it in three pillars, you know, compensation benefits and the employee experience. And we think all three need to be in place to, to otherwise become an employer of choice. You know, this study, the reason why it's highlighted in yellow, the study is focused primarily, if not almost exclusively, on the compensation piece, you know, the internal equity of the jobs, how competitive you are you externally, and bringing everything together you know, using a formal system and helping develop a formal system. But when it comes to benefits, and when it comes to the employee experience, you know, quite frequently we'll hear from employers, well, what about our superb benefits package? And in many cases, that's exactly the case. Um, and I would say in today's world, it's becoming more and more imperative to maybe offer more than what we have been comfortable with on the benefit side of things to, to attract and retain employees. But it's a different analysis and it's a separate process. Um, 
if if you feel your benefits are superior and the compensation is superior and one should be discounted for the other. Um, really, that's a different analysis and, and you know, we certainly have tools that we can look at that if, if needed. But that third pillar, I think, is the one that's most often overlooked, and that is the notion of the employee experience. You know, Gallup, you know, I think, is, is the one that we use the most. Um, they're the most well known, I believe, for um, their their political polls. But really, we use them for their employee engagement, employee experience surveys, and data. And they do a fantastic job of, of tracking a lot of this data. But how connected? Are your employees to your organization? And are you developing the talent? All of those sorts of things. Um, I, I think the data shows time and time again that you can have the best compensation system and the best benefit system, but if employees don't feel as if they're connected, they don't have a good environment, a good culture to work in, um, it's not going to matter all that long. You might be able to bring people in, but will you be able to retain them if the, the experience isn't that great? So again, all three of those are, are equally important to us. But in, in, as it relates to compensation and, and as it relates to the project, you know, although there are countless questions that we, we work with and we've had numerous, numerous conversations with your management team trying to bring this to completion, that there are four underlying questions that we're always trying to solve. Who are we comparing to? And you know, whether that, and we'll talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail as we move along here this evening, where do you want to be in that marketplace? And I'll just foreshadow that one that it, that used to be an autopilot question where it would almost answer itself. And it really isn't anymore. And I'll explain why as, as we get there. Um, we want to talk about what type of a structure do you want to put in place for your employees? And then where the rubber hits the road in all cases, you know, how do we implement it? How do we sustain the, the compensation program moving into the future? And certainly that's going to get more and more challenging as we move forward. The groundwork's laid um, through job analysis and job evaluation, and it lays that groundwork for the rest of those questions. And so that foundation being job documentation, you know, once we receive that job documentation and, and every employee in the organization or every classification, I should say, had the opportunity to complete job documentation for our review. Um, we met with the department managers to, to talk about the questions we had regarding the jobs, perhaps any concerns they might have had. And we, when we received that, we were able to make some pretty quick analyses on, on several of the jobs. One being, do we think we have a market match for that particular classification? And you know, some of those other things, such as job title, do the job title, does the job title match the job duties, so on and, and so forth. And then as we've had a chance to just go through the jobs, then we start evaluating them, evaluating them for content using a job evaluation system. And then we also know that there are certain situations where, as the slide implies, you know, that when the system and the market do not align, that sometimes internal salary compression, oftentimes in the police and fire world, we, we have a concern about employee overtime and and the pay of the supervisors um, supervising those employees. Sometimes the market is just so incredibly hot for a particular classification that it's it's hard to keep up and job evaluation quickly becomes irrelevant. And so we have to address that. But then we also have to make certain that our clients have the appropriate policy or, or strategy in place. And that's really at the heart of a lot of these conversations that are going on. But as we dig into our jobs, um, we're looking at each one through the lens of five major factors. And if you look at the criteria set forth in um, Equal Pay Act or Equal Employment Opportunity Legislation or, or um, case law, those sorts of things, these factors really track with um, what those, those guidelines establish. And so the first thing that we're looking at, and in fact, let me, let me just pause here. With the five main factors, there are sub factors in each one of those. And so if you look at that first one, um, thinking challenges, we're really looking at the context and complexity of the thinking challenges and what type of a response. And so that's really where our work begins. So I'm gonna flip over to the next slide because it kind of puts it in words as opposed to just a, a picture. But as we work our way through, as I implied, you know, we're, we're first looking at the problems that we're asking employees for that particular classification to resolve and we use certain words on a, on a frequent basis, such as um, on a regular basis. It's not just a matter of 
an employee has a difficult problem once or twice a year, but on, on a fairly regular basis, how complex are those problems? and what type of thought is required to resolve those problems. Each one of these, as we go through them, has a continuum or a spectrum of, of possible responses that go from very, in, in, in the case of um, the complexity of the problems, very, very low complexity. And I believe that there are seven steps that take you all the way through um, very, very high complexity and, and different explanations and, and thought process behind each. And so we're able to arrive at, at point values by assigning um, our observations to those. So now that I had laid that groundwork, you know, as we move from thinking challenges, then we look at what types of decisions are we empowering that classification to make? You know, how much freedom, first of all, to very confined to almost no, no confinement, um, over which slice of the organization are they empowered or, or meaningfully contribute to the decision-making process? ranging from their job to their department, to multiple departments, to the entire organization. And then we're also looking at what is the magnitude of their participation in these decisions, such as they are an information provider. Um, perhaps maybe they are making suggestions, perhaps they're making, they're, or they're participating in those decisions, or they are indeed a final decision maker. And then we also look at the interactions as it relates to you know, the the context of the business communications, is it internal or is it all encompassing? And what's the end result? What is the impact on the flow of information or data in the organization? Those first three um, factors really kind of flow from one to the next. And then as we look at work environment, what we're simply looking at is what are the types of things that can hurt an employee in the course of their job? And what are the physical requirements of that job? And then knowing all of the factors above and also Sometimes it's required by statute or other legal guidelines. Sometimes it is um, a insistence of the organization. But what is the formal preparation and experience required to qualify for the job? And so with each one of those, and this is not the city, you know, but you know, being a sample, each one of those, we have a jumble of letters and numbers that actually mean something to us. So if I look at that supervisor line, for example, that 6D in formal preparation and experience, in our language, that's a bachelor's degree in four to five years of experience. The point is that each of those factors are rated for every single classification in your organization. Every single classification therefore has a point value that we're able to then build a pay structure and actually do some analysis on behalf of the city. And it's at this point, you know, and I'm just gonna use the number 100, if we had 100 jobs in the organization that we were reviewing, we might look at that list and based on our experience, based on a, a, a level of analysis that we believe we can match you know, 60 of those jobs to the outside marketplace. It might be 70, it might be 55, but we, we wanna make certain that we have benchmark jobs that we are then beginning to match outside the organization. So we can, again, do some external comparisons. And I'm not gonna go through this in extensive detail, except for we're looking for standard and consistent when we're looking at jobs. And able to see the different variations of those jobs that we might see within your organization as compared to the external marketplace. And so when we do so, we can then look at your current pay through a couple of lenses. and. Um, this helps lay the foundation. So again, this is not every job in the organization, but it is your the benchmark jobs that we selected. And this is your data. We look at the current actual pay and you can see that, you know, it's, it's pretty consistent that our observation going along the bottom part of this graph, it's gonna stop like this. So going down here, this is our observation for each job. So this particular job, whatever it might be, is about 700 points. And if you are currently paying it, about $35 per hour. And so each one of those are plotted. And then we just ask our computer program to put that line that represents the line of best fit through all of those dots. And by and large, as employees increase in duties and responsibility, the pay correspondingly increases. There's some variation off that line, but not all that much. Just for the sake of a future slide, we also look at this through the lens of not your actual pay, but what are the midpoints of your pay structures? 
And so when we look at that, you know, look at it, the line looks very similar. There's a little bit of variation, um, but not enough to cause us any major concern. And so again, both look um, a little different. You know, the, the, the line does wobble just a, a slight bit and you'll see that in, in a future slide here, but it, it lays that groundwork. And as we're looking at this, you know, there's differences from that line. Some are below, some are above. And more often than not, those, those differences can expl be explained by any number of, of realistic factors. It might be the market. Maybe you had to hire somebody higher up into your pay range than what you would have liked. Education and experience. Um, the, the job title, um, location. You know, it, this isn't always the case in the public sector. Tenure is certainly one. Performance ratings. The point is that there's any number of reasons why that, that particular job might not fall precisely on that line. But the reasons that we have to make certain that we're not accounting for, and these are the legal reasons, you know, we not, don't want to account for race, we don't want to account for age or sex. We, we want to be as independent and unbiased as we possibly can in this process. And, and I believe that we, we meet that test again and again. And so once we have the jobs evaluated, we're then able to begin having a conversation with that first question, which is, what is that market of comparison? And, you know, for us doing this work, you know, what we have found that there's really two marketplaces that we're always talking about. There's a lot of overlap between the two, but the traditional who is like us, same size, maybe similar budget, housing values, all of those sorts of things. Um, really come into play and it gives that sense of security. And I would say if I were to rewind a decade or so, that that was probably the most common model when we you know, still had a substantially large collective bargaining environment. Doesn't make it right, doesn't make it wrong, just that's what it, what it was. But we also have to be mindful of the competitive marketplace. You know, who, who is trying to take your talent? You know, where are you situated? So in your particular case, you are situated nicely between, you know, Green Bay and Milwaukee in the I-43 corridor, and it's not all that hard to get to Fond du Lac or, or Appleton area relatively quickly as well. So we want to be, make certain that we are um, being mindful of, of that labor pool as well. So as we look, as we move forward, you know, in terms of looking at the data for, for this particular project, we wanted to make certain that we were had a good representation of somewhat like size communities. And for the most part, not all of these, but for the most part, you know, in a relatively compact area, there's a handful um, Beloit across, you know, being two good examples where similarly sized. Um, and as we look at other jobs, you know, within the organization, especially your professional, your advanced technical, your management level jobs, that if you have a vacancy, you know, the desire to be competitive, and being able to test yourself against these factors. So we collected market data from all these organizations and included them in our analysis. In addition to the public sector data, we also pulled data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics as applicable. Um, pay factors is our data warehousing software, but they also have pay data included as part of our subscription that we're able to utilize. Comp data and Willis Towers Watson are two paid survey sources that we use and are, are highly reliable and respected. And then for a handful of your jobs, um, the American Water Works Association conducts an annual survey that we use for water and wastewater type jobs. So with that market, we also have to be, and, and as we kind of move forward to developing a pay structure, we have to have some confidence in the model that we're using for you, the surveys you know, the data cuts. And when we talk about data cut in a wage survey, similar size, similar geography, revenue, FTE, um, as applicable. In some cases, we use a, a more comprehensive cut. And, and also being mindful that not all data is created equal. You know, some organizations might be viewed as outliers. And so we are able to analyze the data statistically to make certain that we're not um, including data that should not be there, whether it is extremely high or extremely low data. And again, we try to be very consistent in our approach, um, the jobs that were selected as benchmarks, and then getting the feedback and review from management to make certain that we are headed down that right pathway. And so once we have that, once we have a good model designed and a good set of benchmark jobs, we then can create what's called the market line, the pay line. Now, that line that we will use 
to then build, um, my apologies, then, then build a, a pay structure for you. So as, as we look at this, um, what we want to be certain of is that one, we've got the good model and, and this in, indicator here, um, I want to get in the weeds here for about 30 seconds, the coefficient of determination um, really is our indicator or barometer of how good is that model that we use to build your pay structure. And with all of these factors in here, once we get to 90, we're relatively confident. Once we get to 95, um, we're extremely confident. Anything beyond 95 is just being greedy. And, and we got lucky here with this uh, particular project that it lined up so nicely from a data perspective. Um, the one thing I want to illustrate, because we'll talk about this as we work our way through, is that this is based on the 50th percentile of the marketplace. And so when I, when I talk about that, um, the 50th percentile or the median means that you are going to pay right in the middle of the marketplace. Half of the organizations mathematically are going to pay more than you, and half of the organizations mathematically are going to pay less than you. And, and that's, as we'll talk about in just a couple slides here, that's kind of been the way of the world for quite some time. And so let's kind of talk about this because we're going to work our way through this. When it comes to market competitiveness, um, World at Work, which is our professional association for compensation professionals, conducts a survey, I believe every, if it's not every year, it's every two years, asking organizations for their practices. How, how are you approaching certain things? And so that and if I were to focus your attention even on that top line, what is the base target for organizations when it comes to compensation? And you can see that the overwhelming majority, 77%, build their pay structures at the 50th percentile. There's another 11% that you know go above the 50th percentile. And of course, you know, good intentions don't always pan out. That you know, in practice, it's a little bit less um, at the 50th percentile, it's a little bit more um, at the 50th, 75th percentile. So again. As I indicate, this has been the way of the world as long as I can remember, and, and probably as long as any of us can remember as it, you know, as it relates to building pay structures. And then the wheels fell off our labor market in the last year or two. And, and so what we're beginning to see is, is competition unlike we've ever seen before, on top of um, the, the phenomena related to the, the, the baby boomer generation, Continuing, continuing its exit from the workforce. Um, quite honestly, that's been talked about as long as I've been um, working, you know, that this was something that we knew was going to happen and is now happening. And quite, um, it's quite scary that Generation X isn't far behind to begin their wave. You know, we're certainly not as large, but it, it, you know, it just happens with every particular generation. But we're finding more and more competition in the marketplace. And if that's not the most obvious statement of the night, I don't know what is because I think every organization is feeling it. So we are then able to show you a comparison. And as I talk about this, I don't want to create um, a lack of confidence in our work, but I don't like these lines because they don't always tell the most accurate story. They're helpful visually, but to say that, you know, that your current pay, and again, we're talking about current actual pay with this particular comparison that your current pay is slightly above market. First of all, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that at all because again, as you are trying to compete, you're, you're, you're paying, you're having to pay positions more aggressively within your current structure to recruit or retain employees. But this is about as, as close to being on the market as you can find. And it implies that there's a uniformity to this. But even, even here, you know, where even though it's ever so slight, that someone currently paid above, you might have a position, you know, one grade down or right next to it that is paid below the market. So it is simply overall, here's how you land. If I overlay the, instead of the current actual pay, if I look at the midpoints, the, the, you, believe it or not, there is a gray, gray line there. It's almost imperceivable. You can see it peeking out um, below the black. And so that tells us you've got a very competitive wage structure as it currently stands. But I want to talk about some reality here. And this is one where now, now we have to break out our crystal ball. You know, we start talking about market data, I would say in any other um, 
period, aside taking the last two, maybe two and a half, three years out, um, market data is pretty reliable and is usually pretty useful for a period of time, whether it's 12 months, 18 months, maybe in some cases even 24. There's not a lot of dynamic movement throughout the marketplace until we get to today. And so when I look at this, first of all, remember that any piece of data that you get, whether it is consumer price index, unemployment, or salary data in this particular um, situation is going to be backward looking. It's gonna tell you what happened as opposed to what is happening. Now it might help predict the future with the appropriate measures, but we're looking backwards in most cases. From the public sector, that most of the pay structures, if not with some exceptions as organizations are making mid-year corrections, that they're based on decisions made during last year's budget cycle. And, you know, of course, the public sector can't respond as rapidly as the private sector because there, there are budgets that need to be adopted and need to be adhered to. But even in the private sector, without a pandemic and without a competitive marketplace, by law, that data has to be at least three months old before it gets into a survey. And in many cases, it's often six to 12 months old before that survey is published. And as that survey continues to be used and waiting for the next version of said survey to come out. So we're, we're well aware of that. And we have some tools to age the data forward. Um, we are forever tracking changes in the marketplace as it relates to wages or other dynamics. We do our own surveys to see what's going on. And so what kind of goes forward from here is kind of based on, we know that where you stand, as I indicated, is in a highly competitive position, but you're also in an uncertain position. And so let's talk about some possible options that we might look at. And I'll show you an example of a, 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 a compensation structure perfect, perfectly on the market, and we'll talk about some alternatives. But that third question, how do you design it? What type of a structure and so when we look at this, there's a lot of things that we need to take into consideration. Some of those kind of flow through our conversations, you know, how do employees move from one end of the structure to the next? You know, are there compression concerns that we need to take into consideration, whether it be police or fire or some other department? Are there some jobs that are unique to the marketplace that um, maybe it's not relevant, the job evaluation system isn't relevant, we need to look at market. Certainly financial or budget concerns weigh into this as well as some of those other matters and even talking about you know performance, what role does performance play in this conversation? And so this next slide here, I, I, I put it on here because I wanna make certain that you have the reference point when we start showing you what we're doing with some of these numbers, where these numbers came from. And that's really all the slide is intended. So we're gonna be talking about grade 11 in just a few moments here. And so remember I talked about how every single job in your organization had a point value. So you might have a job that is 481 points, another job that is 512 points. Well, by building grade ranges, so from 470, in this example, 479 to 514, all jobs within that threshold would be placed in the same grade. And that 496 and a half is that middle value, simply taking 479, plus 514 dividing by two, that's that middle value. They got a very important thing that we'll talk about in just a moment here. So I bring this up because we're gonna talk about this equation in just a moment. And that Y equals is just Y being, it's this line will intercept somewhere down here if it was zero points. But we can then build, and this is also helps us build the, the line or here to help build a pay structure. And I'll show you how we use that line and that intercept to, to build a pay structure for the city. And when we talk about building a pay structure, we've got some common language or some terminology we wanna make certain that we're talking about here. We have this term CP, control point. And there are essentially four different models. And then there's a million and one different variations off of these models that you could employ a single rate model, um, unless it was an individual classification, city administrator might be a good example um, in some cases, that you have to be on top of the market in every single instance. If you built a pay structure for 100 classifications on a single rate model, 
you have to be certain that you're on the market for each one of those 100 classifications or you're gonna have challenges. These other three models give you some flexibility. If the market shifts within two or three percentage points, that you've got a range of pay that hopefully captures that structure. And so in a step-based model, which is the tried and true, and I, I would say exclusive to the public sector, um, I think a lot of private sector organizations still use these, um, but there is a step increment that employees progress through, um, the minimum and maximum, and as you can see, it's not as robust as the next structure and performance, either at the bottom or at the top. That's intentional. Um, mathematically, what this is intended to represent is that 87.5% of the control point, give or take, that's intended to represent the 25th percentile of the marketplace. That's where most organizations start their structures, either the, the, the 25th or, or, or the 20th percentile, or I'm sorry, the 10th, depending on the structure, which we'll talk about next. And the 112.5% is intended to represent about the 75th percentile. So paying between, in this particular example, between the 25th and the 75th percentile puts you in a competitive position provided the structure itself is, is competitive. Performance-based model, um, the first question if an organization asks me if they if, should we go down performance-based model is, an, dialogue relating to the status and quality of the current performance management system. Um, that's not to say that many, if not most organizations have a desire or would have a preference towards performance-based pay. There are a lot of challenges with doing it in the best of circumstances, but when you move over to the public sector, um, there are a few additional challenges, such as transparency. Um, the the notion that every employee knows what every other employee makes um, certainly can be challenging, especially when it comes to allocating performance-based increases. Um, funding a performance pool that is adequate and sufficient to incentivize performance is a challenge. And that's speaking nothing to the challenges of trying to get 10, 15 different departments, all with different missions going in different directions on the same page as it relates to performance management. It's possible, but it's very challenging and difficult, and especially in an environment where you know having making sure that you are staffed appropriately in a human resources world, that certainly would be a difficult proposition. And then this last one is just simply taking both of these that we have a step process to the control point and then open range or performance thereafter. So when I flip to this next page here, you're going to notice some differences, which is why I say we've got four different models, but then we vary them depending on the client. And I'll walk through each one of these points. First of all, we are recommending a step plan. Uh, we are not recommending the step plan, but this is the first calculation that we go through along the way. And so how do we get here is I probably the best example. Um, so what I see here, remember I talked about that 496.5. And then this equation is simply that equation you saw on that graph, that y equals. So it's 2785 is that y. And plugging these other numbers into that formula, we result in 2785 for the control point. And how we built each one of these grades going up is we find the middle value for each one of those grades and just simply substitute that number in. So the point for tonight is that we are not pulling numbers out of thin air. Um, there's a, a very precise method that we utilize to, to build this structure. A couple other things I think are very much worth noting is that as we looked at this, um, we do believe in, in the current uh, marketplace that 87.5% is probably too shallow in the marketplace to effectively hire. And so we're recommending building that minimum at 90% of the control point if you look at those two numbers. And then we simply took that extra 2.5% um, and we put it at the top at 115% at the maximum. We think that both of those help you in the long run in maintaining a competitive balance. The other part is, and this kind of comes down to the challenge that's associated with maintaining a structure that the steps from minimum through step four up to the control point, or step five in this example, is two and a half percentage points. 
that's pretty standard. And I, I don't know that I would recommend varying that too much. We want to make certain that we're moving employees to that market estimate, that control point in a relatively and reasonable um, fashion, relatively quick and reasonable fashion. Beyond that, knowing that the organization still has to look on an annual basis, what is the market doing? Whether it is CPI, whether it is the employment cost index, another metric that's um, measured by the government, or some other metric that you choose to utilize, how much do we need to increase our overall structure to keep it competitive? Knowing that there's that going on, we want to make certain that you are putting yourself in the best position to afford it. And so we are recommending one and a quarter percent steps above the control point. It gives you a longer shelf life for the plan. It keeps employees moving through the structure in a regular fashion, but again, isn't as big of a budgetary blow to the city um, as, uh, as cutting these out, out and having two and a half percent steps above. So that's the ultimate design. And we'll talk about the recommended plan in just a few moments here. But we also want to make certain we identify that when it comes to implementation, there's some challenges. You know, budget. Budget is always an issue. Um, and as we work our way through these, um, I'll lean on, on, on Caitlin and, and Todd to provide some, some real life numbers as it relates to implementation. But I also think that in most communities, are, look at this, you know, that we, we want to pay competitively, but we don't want to pay too much, nor do we want to pay too low. We also know that there's this balance between happiness and fairness. I learned a long time ago that I have zero control over happiness. I, I wish I did. I like it when people are happy. I prefer people to be happy, but I know that I have no control over it. I think we do have some control you know, as it relates to you know, working with the city to come up with something that is fair. You know, we're not treating, we're not playing favorites. We're trying to treat everyone as equitably as possible. There might be certain circumstances as we talked about previously um, related to compression or market that we have to, to look at, but we wanna make certain that we're being fair. And I think that's the best possible outcome overall that we can point our fingers to that we, we do believe we've been fair in, in our approach. Two challenges for you, and I, I identify these one because I need to, but two, I think we're trying to um, come up with a solution that addresses both of these in some way, shape or form. So the first being, you know, one of the frustrations that can often occur is the size of the increase. When you work with implementing a step-based program, the lowest cost, in fact, next slide we'll talk about some preliminary costs, the lowest cost option for implementing is moving employees onto the step that provides an increase in pay. Now, that using that in quotes, an increase in pay could mean a penny. If I'm paid $25 today, and the step in the new structure that provides an increase in pay for me is $25.01, that's where I move. Well, realistically, that's about a $20.80 um, annual impact to my, my household budget. We probably want to look at something a little bit more than that, especially in today's world. Um, but the other one, and this one's a little bit more difficult to recognize and a little bit harder to fully take into account when it comes with implementation, and that's length of service. That you might have employees who have been with you for 15, 20 years, and they're being recommended to be placed at step three. That's a little bit of a challenge, you know, if you, or especially if that job is underpaid in the market significantly and that 20 year employee goes to step one and then you hire somebody tomorrow. You know, you, it's, it's not the end of the world, but what that compression that comes with it certainly causes an existing employee to scratch their head and say, well, what about all those years of service? Am I not training this new employee? All those sorts of things, you know, are certainly things that would be um, legitimate concerns of the employees. And so size of the increase in length of service are often a challenge. And I also have to put a little notation in here that you know, when it comes to these processes, our firm, we only recommend, and, and that's you know, all we ever want to be able to do, you know, that we're not the decision makers as it relates to the final product. You as the elected body or the council as a whole have the ability if they choose to make exceptions. We just have to warn you that there's a slippery slope. I would say, first of all, on that slope is this structure is built, what I believe to be a high degree of internal equity. You know, does not take into account any illegal factors, 
um, have been looked at and vetted, we might need to um, make some alterations on an appeal, which we'll talk about at the end here. So the first one being, you know, every exception you make can chip away at that internal equity. But the other piece is that, that chain reaction piece. That if you grant an exception for one department, why wouldn't you grant it for the next? If you grant an exception for one employee, why wouldn't you grant it for the, for the next? And so again, that can have that chain reaction. And so I just need to put that out there in front of you. Um, that's not to imply that you would never have a situation where it wouldn't be necessary to make an exception because those do exist, but I would just be very cautious about that in, in, in your decision-making. As it relates to the cost um, for the proposed, I'm gonna go through these quickly, at least at this one, only because um, we will have the cost of, in terms of what's being recommended. I put bookend one, bookend two, the most, the, the two ones we just talked about, you know, the step to revise and increase and looking at all of these step, um, years of service, taking that into account as it relates to placement in the new schedule. So we're looking at a 1% lift on payroll for the step to revise and increase. Um, or if we were to look at all of the years of service, 4.5%. Not that, to be honest, it's not that earth shattering. And I think because of your current placement in the marketplace, if you remember those um, comparison graphs, that kind of explains it. The story is gonna change a little bit as we move forward and with our, our recommended approach. I also threw in here the library data, um, certainly from a dollars standpoint isn't as large. From a, from a percentage standpoint, is significantly larger um, than what the city's is. And so we want to make certain that we're, we're taking that into account. I've been hinting at this for a few slides now that, you know, we think that there's an alternative approach. And I want to make certain that I explain myself in terms of why we think that this is the, the best approach. And so in this particular example, I'm looking at the midpoint, that gray line, um, I'm sorry, the black line being your midpoint. The, I'm sorry, current, I, I misspoke here, your current, the gray line being that 50th percentile marketplace. So again, remember that that one was slightly below the black line. If we were to go all the way out to the 75th percentile, which means that 75% of organizations would pay less than you and 25% would pay more. It's a pretty aggressive approach. Um, I think overall, if I kind of, Fast forward, you know, a few years, I think the marketplace is going to go back to a 50th percentile marketplace. I'm convinced of it because that's what's happened for quite some time. We're just going through a little bit of a bubble right now. But I also think, you know, if you remember that slide I had as it relates to challenges with data in the marketplace in this world, I think it would be incredibly helpful to kind of get a running start. Now, when I say a running start, if we take the, fifth, the data based on the 50th percentile of the marketplace and the data based on the 75th percentile, average those two numbers, that's what that blue line represents. And so if I look at that, it certainly is putting you in a position where you are going to be more competitive. And I would equate this to, you know, I, in fact, my observation the other night as I was talking about this is my, my son runs, just got done running track for the season. And runs the mile and you know, when you're watching a race, you can see some kid who goes out like gangbusters and you think to yourself, yeah, the pack is going to reel him or her back in um, by the time the race comes to an end. And I think the same thing here is that putting yourself in that position of you know, the 50th, 75th percentile is your head start. But by the end of the race, you know, if I fast forward two or three years, the market's going to reel you back in. And if you were to reassess, I wouldn't doubt that you are a lot closer, if not on the 50th percentile marketplace um, when all is said and done. So it's, it's a strategy to kind of give a quick boost, to acknowledge that you are experiencing challenges hiring and, and, and retaining in this marketplace. And I, and I think, you know, certainly puts you in, in a better position. So from a pay structure standpoint, the exact same structure, 90, 115, two and a half, one and a quarter, but those control points are, are certainly a little bit higher um, and allows you to place yourself, um, like I said, in a competitive position. I put this graph in here just to illustrate because every once in a while, and we'll talk about an appeals process in, in a couple slides here, 
but we'll have an employee who says, I think I should be in a grade 12 instead of a grade 11. If grade 12 started or grade 11 stopped, and if we were wrong, that would be pretty significant. And, and, I, and I, it puts a lot of pressure on us and we still have a lot of pressure on us to get this right the first time through. And, and I think we are, if we are not there, we are really, really, really close. But because there is overlap between those two, that if we are off by one grade, it might be frustrating to an employee. We certainly might need to take a look at it at some point, but it doesn't often rise to um, a grievous error or um, a, a challenging position. So I, I wanna make certain that we understand that there is a significant amount of overlap between these grades. And if you look at the actual wage structure, you can, you can see that how one grade grows from the other. As it relates to cost to you, um, I would look at those two bookends. Now we see that number growing from 105 um, to 209. Um, I'm sorry, not, it was 1.05, but you know, 209,000 or 1.77%. So a little bit of growth there based on that new marketplace. But here is where it gets a little bit more challenging. If you recall, it was about four and a half percent to recognize everybody's years of service. If you were to do it in this alternative structure, it would be just under a million dollars or just over 8% to do so. Um, for the library, again, this is not this process, but um, you know, again, we're looking at much larger numbers you know, from a percentage and a dollar standpoint in that particular example. I'm just gonna wind this down and I'll, I'll turn it back over since I'm on a roll here. Um, I just talked about, you know, the possibility of an employee appealing their classification um, rating as it relates to grade placement. And I think it's important to the employees, but I also think it's to you as the decision makers to know what an appeal is and what it isn't. You know, in an appeal, first of all, we have to have an adopted structure. You know, and I'll talk about that on the next slide and as it relates to why that is. But we're looking at the grade placement. We're not looking at step placement. Um, it provides us the opportunity to dot our I's, cross our T's. Um, if we were working for a private sector organization, I would hazard, in fact, I know this because we do work in several private sector orgs that we almost never have an appeals process because nobody knows what anybody else has paid for the most part. And we know that there's greater communication um, in, in today's world. But because everything is public here, we want to make certain that we've, we've got as accurate a structure as, as possible. And there's also jobs, especially as a project, you know, wanes on, jobs might have changed during the course of the study, and it gives us the opportunity to clean that up. What it's not, and I think most importantly, is it's not an opportunity to undermine any of your decisions. This is not a performance evaluation. You know, I wish Jane or Jim would be placed higher in their grade or even at a higher at a higher grade as opposed to a higher in a, in a step movement um, because they're fantastic. Well, that's great. And I hope you have uh, an organization full of rock stars and people who are, who are doing great work for you. But this is not the process to reward performance. Um, again, we talked about modify the step placement. Um, I think as, you, as we work our way through the costing options that modifying, you know, allowing somebody to appeal their step placement can completely undermine the financial model that your, your management team has used to come up with an implementation strategy, nor is there an opportunity to undermine, you know, the marketplace. If you said, we're going to use these 15, 20 employers, someone says, I want to use my own, it, it just doesn't work that way. So we're, we're not trying at all that the council's decisions for the most part remain intact. All we're talking about is the grade placement and that's usually a, a low impact um, process. In terms of the process itself, I will leave this here for your review. Just understand we work our way through adoption. We do share some information with employees. That's often challenging only from the standpoint of um, it's complete information to us because we work in these systems on a day in day out basis. It's not as easy for employees to just jump into it and completely understand it, but we also feel that we need to share information to bring some level of confidence. There's a formal appeal. We ultimately review it with the employee, with the management team, with the department head, and then come back and give a recommendation to the city for the final approval. So for us, we give you a structure, you know, a sound program. 
You have to make certain it's meeting your strategic goals and is equitable and competitive and all of those sorts of things um, and ultimately result in a final, final balancing act. And I would say those first three are first and foremost on employees' minds. And I would say council members as well. Um, but is it equitable? You know, have we established the appropriate hierarchy, you know, from one job to the next? Are you able to bring jobs in and retain people in the organization? Is it competitive? You know, even if it isn't um, a performance-based structure that if somebody leaves the organization and you choose to combine duties or restructure jobs, you're able to have them reevaluated based on the new way the employee is contributing to the organization. So those first three, again, I think are pretty important to employees. And then the last three, I think is where the decision-making process really takes over, which is, can we afford it? Can we find the year one money to implement? And between this one and the next one, this is probably the easier of the two. Finding one-time money is always easy. It's that second one, is it sustainable? Can you afford years two, three, four, and beyond with you know, your growing costs? Because again, wages, even though in today's marketplace, they're at a premium and is probably the time when employees are the asset that require the most investment, that other costs are increasing as well. And so knowing all of that and knowing you know, these other factors, you know, equitable all the way through sustainable, is it something that can be adopted? And we hope that it is. So I've blazed my way through this pretty, I, I like to say quickly, um, relatively quickly for me. Um, happy to answer any questions you have or um, go from there. Well, Patrick, thank you for presenting the committee. I'm going to hand this over to Administrator thank Wolf. You. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Patrick, for, for your time. And I understand that you have a, a tight schedule, so we'll ask the, the committee if they have questions. But I did want to point out that this process obviously did take a very long time. Uh, we had our own internal um, missteps, as well as, you know, we had some changes within the Carlson Detman group. But we really feel very strongly that this is a really good program. Um, as, as Patrick had pointed out, we've gone through the, the JDQs, which is basically a review of all of the job descriptions, making sure that they're, they were vetted and then re-vetted and then vetted again to make sure that they're accurate and complete to the best of our ability. And then from there, just to summarize from the, from the job descriptions, the wage scales were built to the, to the actual position. So we are not looking at people we are looking at positions. Again, we have to look at all of the positions in the non-rep throughout the city, whether it's DPW, um, wastewater, water, or not really water, but um, you know, D city hall, all of the different departments that have non-rep. So this is, a, this is actually a much bigger opportunity than what we really did, realized when we took this on. And if you recall, I actually brought this forward to the council back in 2020 that our wage scale and scales were, um, had some significant issues in them. So basically we're taking this and we're breaking it down into one wage scale. We're also bringing uh, the, the pages, the seasonal um, employees and the um, crossing guards onto the actual wage scale so that they're all under the same umbrella. And we're also taking this from, and as uh, Patrick had pointed out, we're starting at a 90% and we're taking it to a 115. We do know that and we, we understand that um, right now in the market, things are very uh, turbulent. We, we don't feel that it's a good, a good time to actually try to address that. Uh, we need to take care of the, the team that we have in place and that also will help us with bringing additional team members on in the future. But again, what we're pr proposing would go into effect um, July 10th, so for the first six months. So today's um, review was to help the uh, finance department to better understand how the sausage was made, as some would say, and that'll allow us to better understand the steps moving forward. Any questions? Todd, if I might weigh in for a moment here. 
Yes, please. Uh, because I know my time is short this evening, um, I will and am available for the June 7th meeting to answer questions as well. Perfect. Thank you. Perfect. And I'm not seeing any questions from committee members at this time, so I believe we can let you go. And thank you again, Patrick. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Have a great evening, everyone. And I, and I do want to point out to the uh, Finance and Personnel Committee, if there are questions, please reach out to Caitlin and myself, and we are more than willing to walk through it, explain it, um, and just review it to make sure that everybody understands it clearly. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving to our last bit of the agenda then. Uh, our next meeting is on June 7th, the special meeting that we've just discussed. Our next regular meeting is on June 13th, and with that, we'll be looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second, seeing no discussion. All in favor? Aye. aye. All opposed? Chair votes aye. The ayes have it. The motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>